Well, good afternoon from me, Brian Gerrish, and Mike Robinson in the UK Column Live studio in Plymouth, England. And we've got another 30 minutes news program for you today. We're going to home in on the Lord's reform, which we believe is a critical area um, of government policy at the moment that is not being accurately reported in the mainstream press. Um, so we'll be coming on to that in, in a minute um, to have a look at it in detail. Uh, we've got a guest in the, shoot in the studio today. Um, that's Mr. Tony Shell, who is also going to comment on um, uh, the Lord's reform issue. Um, but b b b <laughs> excuse me, before we get on to that, um, I'd just like to comment on a couple of issues in the mainstream press today. Um, we've got G4S security, of course, um, where finally the mainstream uh, press and media have picked up on failings within the company. Now, we are quite interested in the fact that um, alternative media was reporting these serious failings by G4S uh, weeks, literally weeks before anything was appearing in the mainstream media and press. And this really shows us um, the power of alternative media. So thank you to all of you who've tuned into the UK Column Live this afternoon. Uh, but of course, there are, are many other stations that are now coming online uh, reporting because of the failure of organisations such as the BBC to report truthfully what's actually happening in the country. I've got two stories which um, really work back to back because whilst G4S is failing dramatically to uh, implement a, an appropriate level of security for the Olympic Games, um, we've also got um, David Cameron back on the subject of Iran and uh, we've also had uh, recently Sir John Sawyer's head of um, secret intelligence services, MI6, commenting on this issue. So at the moment in Britain we have the bizarre situation where David Cameron's government is incapable of providing security for the Olympic Games. Uh, we have given that task to a private security company, G4S, that has failed to provide the number uh, the 17,500 uh, security personnel that it was tasked within the £284 million contract. Um, we're now having to bring in 3,500 British forces to help bolster their failings. This is, of course, more men being taken from a British army which is about to be uh, cut by 20,000 men. So whilst David Cameron at the moment is busy cutting the British Army to the bone and ensuring that it becomes more and more difficult for the British, armies, British Army to defend this country properly. Uh, we also have uh, the same David Cameron talking about what action he's going to be taking against Iran. And there seems to be, there seems to be a big hole in the middle of these uh, two subjects. Um, the story for Sir John Sawyers is that he's claiming that thanks to action by MI6 together with uh, American um, security services and Israeli security services, um, they have been able to stop progress by Iran in um, creating nuclear weapons and that we should be grateful for the work carried out by MI6 but he goes on to say that nevertheless it's expected that Iran will have nuclear weapons within two years and thus they have only managed to delay any decision by the British government to attack Iran. Uh, what is particularly interesting with uh, Sir John Sawyer's comments is that he continually refers to problems with American and Israeli security to the extent that one has to ask whether his true agenda is to work for the British people in ensuring that it is Britain that is protected and the British people that, that are protected, or are his interests really lying both with the Israelis and the Americans? Um, we will wait to see how this subject um, develops, but it does appear clear that whilst we're incapable of providing proper security at the Olympic Games, the government is now moving along a path 
to take some form of preemptive strike against Iran. Okay, well, we'll now move on to the subject of House of Lords reform. Um, one of the key issues, uh, Mike, on this one is, has been what Mr. Nick Clegg has been doing in the background. And a subject which UK Column has consistently picked up on is the fact that whilst David Cameron is the man we continually see in front of the cameras, and the man who's continually speaking on what is and is not happening in the country, it's Mr. Nick Clegg who remains hidden in the shadows and is clearly uh, pulling strings on one of the most serious areas um, of this country at the moment, and that is so-called reform of the Constitution. So against that background, Mike, how, how do you see Nick Clegg's efforts on House of Lords reform? Well, I mean, that's exactly right. Uh, uh, Nick Clegg ha has clearly been tasked with constitutional reform, not just House of Lords, uh, but he's talking about, for example, uh, a new Bill of Rights. Well, we've got a Bill of Rights. That the government is attempting right. to more or less deny that we have one, but, but we have one. Um, and it was interesting that, that uh, during his uh, speeches in the House of Commons, Clegg keeps referring to this process of House, reform, House of Lords reform being a 100-year process. Yep. And, and so it might be worthwhile just to, to, to look back at why that he considers that a 100-year process, because what he's actually referring to is the 1911 Parliament Act. Right. Uh, and that act uh, was the first attempt to uh, effectively remove the power of the House of Lords to, to uh, restrict the activities of the House of Commons. Um, and it came about because a bill was, pa was, was presented, a finance bill was presented to the House of Commons in 1910, uh, which went through Parliament. But uh, um, our monarch at the time, which I believe it was Edward VII, uh, refused royal assent on that, uh, on that bill because he felt that, that this was not a constitutional bill. Sure. Uh, it, was, yeah. it was a bill to raise taxes. Right. Uh, and, uh, and so he refused royal assent on that. Uh, unfortunately, he then died, and the following year, in 1911, that um, Parliament Act was 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 resubmitted. A bit. So, well, it's just to clarify that the House of Lords was preventing the the, the, the finance bill from going through. So, so the, the Prime Minister of the day attempted to get the Parliament Act through in order to sort of restrict the the limit to limit the House of Lords power to limit the House of Commons. If you follow me, right? So, so the Parliament Act went through uh, uh, in 1911. Right. Um, and. Uh, uh, that that did restrict the House of Lords capabilities to, to limit the House of Commons, uh, but but that stayed uh, status quo then up until 1998, when of course we had the the big Tony Blair uh, uh, reorganisation of the House of Lords, where they where they threw out the the uh, the hereditary Redditry. peers and and started appointing peers. Um, and now what they're talking about is uh, is is um, uh, this business of having a, an 80% elected um, House of Lords, uh, that the uh, individuals who are elected would stand for a single term of 15 years, right. um, and that the, cons the constituencies that they stand for would be drawn on, European, on a European uh, standard. So, so you, you know, Britain is already divided up into regions uh, as part of the European project, and these constituencies would be along those lines. Um, now, as, as has been widely reported in the media, um, there's been a, a, a fairly big uh, backlash um, on all sides of the House because Cle uh, Clegg's initiative for House of Lords reform is, is supported by all three party leaderships, um, but um, backbenchers in, in all three parties are seem to be um, possibly less in the Liberal Democrats, but certainly in the Labour and Conservative Party. They're, uh, uh, a lot of backbenchers that are against this principle of, of changing the House of Lords any further. Right. If, if I can just come in there, um, I, I can imagine that a lot of people are thinking, well, actually, um, we've had a system where people can come into the House of Lords just, just because of who they are, what families they were born into. Um, and what's being proposed is a democratic system. Uh, what, what, would, what, what are the dangers that you see of the system that, that is being created at the moment by Mr Clegg? Well, of course, uh, we're having this word uh, democracy bandied about quite a lot in the yeah. last t 10 years or so, 10 or 15 years, and particularly with, with 
uh, with regards to regime change in other countries. We know we've got to change the regime and we've got to put the democracy in, but, but what type of democracy is it? Because in general what we're looking at is, is, is a form of participatory democracy where, where, where yes, okay, you have elections uh, and, and members of parliament are elected or whatever your, your particular government form, I, form is, yep. uh, Congress or whatever it is. Um, uh, but but what what happens is that um, um, those people then don't represent the views of their constituents. Those people then tend to represent the views of of um, uh, charities or of uh, financial institutions or of corporations to their constituents. So so the policy seems to be set. That, you know what we call democracy isn't really democracy because there's policy gets fed in from other places from third parties yeah. that 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 aren't. Uh, the public, uh, and then and then that policy is sold to the public by our representatives. So d our, the democracy that we have is uh, 180 degrees out, really, from where it should yeah. be. So, so the, the the people that they're talking about bringing into the House of, of, of Lords, what you're flagging up is that these people are sold to us as being independent people. We should respect and trust them because they're not linked to uh, historic families in the country. But in fact, what, what's going to happen is we're, we're actually going to bring in people through the political system. They're going to be tainted by the... Well, it's, it's worse than that in a sense because uh, yeah, it's being presented as being these people are now elected and they're now um, accountable to the public. But of course, there'll be members of the same parties that are in the House of Commons. Yes. So, so what the... Um, they'll be whipped the same way that the House of Commons is whipped. So where is the oversight of the, on the activities of the House of Commons in the House of Lords? There yep. isn't any. Uh, and, and then, of course, you've got the potential of, of uh, an American-style, you know, Conservatives in the Commons, Labour majority in the Lords, and, and deadlock. Well, they, they're dealing with that by only having an 80% elected uh, House of Lords and yep. the other 20% are appointed. Uh, so... So you know, you, th there is no sort of, there is no democracy in this. It's actually dictatorship in a in a in, right. in, in wolf in sheep's clothing, if you want to put it that way. Well, it's Fabian is is the correct exactly. uh, description from from that. Is that this is a creeping, this is a an attack on our constitution and and a, and a direct attack on the House of Lords, but which but is being done as a step by step process. Right, but to answer the question of of. Well, is our our hereditary peers or um, a better system? Well, in a sense, they are, assuming that it, it assumes certain conditions. I mean, it assumes that they're educated in our in our constitution, that they're willing to take the role, that they're there to 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 yeah. to, uh, to to um, serve, uh, and that, and you know, so no system is perfect, but but that was a better system because actually, if you look historically, uh, the hereditary. I mean, the reason that the Parliament Act was brought in in the first place was because the hereditary peers at the time simply said, this piece of legislation that the Commons is attempting to put through is unconstitutional. We cannot um, allow it to pass. Right. Uh, and, and so the Parliament Act was brought in in order to stop the, the Lords from doing that, 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 uh, yeah. that thing. Now, you know, I, I, I've, I've said this to, to many people, but I was sitting in a pub one day with... with uh, um, a friend from South Africa, and so he's he's looking at at Brit he'd been working in Britain for a couple of years, and he's looking at Britain as an outsider, and he's saying, you know, he said to me, it's it staggers me that the only people in this country that are uh, making any effort to protect mm. civil liberties and privacy are th are the the unelected lords, and he and mm. he was making a valid point. Um, the Commons seems to have. Uh, an agenda that it's determined to push through at all costs in many. And I'm talking about the party leaderships here. Yes. Um, uh, and and you know, if we don't have this oversight and this separation of powers and this limiting ability in an upper chamber, um, we're really heading down some pretty dangerous. Yeah. Um, by limiting, you you really mean that the House of Lords has the ability to protect by having a look, a second look at policy that's coming through the Commons and saying, no, this is not good. Um, so it's a protection. It's, it's exactly right. So you know, yeah. and, and in the House of Lords, you, you would you would expect that in that chamber you've got um, people that are more experienced, uh, have seen a bit more of the world, and maybe and maybe have a better understanding of how the country mm. is supposed to be run than than some of the people that are in the Commons that are yeah. particularly in recent years. 
you know, a lot younger. You know, our prime minister is a lot younger than than the typical prime minister of a hundred years ago. Yeah. Uh, you know, he knows nothing. He has yep. no experience of the world, really. Yeah. So, you know, what qualifies him to do the job? That's possibly a different well, we, question. Well, we don't <laughs> know the answer to that. We certainly don't know the answer to that. Yeah. Um, would it be appropriate to um, bring Tony in to yes, uh, just just comment on that? Yeah, I think Mike, you you touched on the key issue here, and that is that of the introduction of party politics into into the upper house. Yeah. Um, very recently, Betty Boothroyd, who was who was formerly the leader of the House of Commons, um, raised very serious concerns about what's going on, particularly from the constitutional point of view. Mm. And one of the points that she made was her great concern at the introduction of a guillotine on debate on this issue. Now, I think that illustrates very neatly the problems of trying to introduce the current type of party politics that we see in um, the House of Commons into the House of Lords. It will introduce that type of political debate, plus the influence behind those um, political parties of various other interest groups. So I think it's very important that uh, the House of Laws is retained as an authority on constitution and as an oversight on the um, lower chamber. Well, of course, one of the fact, one of the things going on at the moment is is that the the um, par se parliament, because there are a number of people in this game, but parliament is busy telling us at the moment that we don't have a constitution. This is one of the biggest lies perpetrated on the British public ever, because clearly we do have a constitution, and we can we can show quite clearly that countries overseas, um, particularly Commonwealth countries, have used our uh, constitution in order to, to build their own system of, of law. Um, but um, Mr. Clegg has been incredibly outspoken saying that we do not have a constitution. Um, um, Mandelson is, is another one that's been pushing this lie and in my opinion what, what's actually happening is that they're now building on that lie to say oh well we now need something else to change the House of Lords uh, and I agree with what you're saying is that the House of Lords is, is a key part of the, the process of freedom and democracy in a proper proper sense. It's also very strange that they're introducing this now, that from what I can see, there's no public clamour for these changes. Um, people aren't out on the streets protesting that they want to change to, to the House of Lords or to our constitution. And as, you, as you say, the politicians are trying to avoid these issues of our actual constitution and what changes these could imply. Well, I think they're, they're doing more than just avoiding them. They're, they're, they're actively um, denying that they exist. I mean, uh, Clegg has stated that Britain needs a Bill of Rights. The, statement that he's, the, the comment that he's, or the, the, the statement that he's made is, Britain needs a Bill of Rights. Now, he's not, he's not um, telling an out and out lie in the sense that he's not saying he's not saying the words Britain does not have a Bill of Rights in there and it needs one but he is implying that Britain does not have a Bill of Rights when he says Britain needs a Bill of Rights we do not need a Bill of Rights sure. and the, the, the key the key thing about our Constitution that we've talked about many many times before is that uh, it's based on the principle that um, uh, we have unlimited God-given rights uh, except where were expressly denied the right to do something through some some form of law, right? So we, we are free to do what we like unless it's prohibited by law. That's contrary to other, to other European countries where everything is prohibited unless it's permitted by law, right? Uh, so um, one of the, the key problems with human rights legislation that I see is that it's, it's basically coming from the European uh, idea that we don't have any rights except for the ones which are listed down on the human rights document. In this country it's the opposite. We have all rights. Our rights are protected. Uh, they should be protected. They're constitutionally protected. They, um, and, uh, and really the, 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 the Bill of Rights is there to, to reinforce that, that, uh, that, that assumption. Um, so what Clegg is attempting to do with all this constitutional reform, whether it be the House of Lords or the Bill of Rights, the new Bill of Rights, is to limit uh, the, the the rights and the protections that, that, that uh, people have. 
Um, and that's that's why it's such a dangerous thing that, that they're doing. And it's it's uh, um, one of the, the key um, areas that they're damaging at the moment is this idea of the separation of powers. Um, that that uh, um, how do we describe the separation of powers in a simple way? But, but basically, you know, there's there's always some kind of oversight um, over over in any particular area of government. So so whether it be the Commons, the Lords, the Judiciary, there's there's oversight between them between them all, and they're they're protecting um, or they're protecting the public from from uh, dictatorship. Well, from from any one any one uh, section of government overstepping its authority and um, acting beyond its authority mm. as, as the common purpose lot like to encourage. Well, that's, that's absolutely true. Well, I, I, I think this bit, there's, a, there's an issue here, of, and I think the issue is deceit. Um, this, is, this is what I see, is that people have never really been interested in, in, in the House of Lords for what it is. It, it's been something that's been there. They, they've heard it mentioned. Lords have spoken out on issues, but people have been very happy with the system because the system has been providing a basically an orderly society. It's been working. This is yeah. this is how I see it. And so the average person in the street, and I was one of them, I knew the House of Lords existed, but but because everything's working properly, you don't you don't need to know much about it. What's happening now is we have the government actually starting to attack the House of Lords. So they are attacking the foundation of, of uh, constitution and law and order in this country. And they're not telling us the truth as to why they're doing it, but clearly what they are doing is taking Britain from a country based on common law it, into a, a new Britain where we are being forced into the European system of, of corpus juris, basically. Uh, I also think that it's, hold it's, hold it's very yeah. worthwhile for um, people to look at the quality of debate in the two houses. If you watch on TV the quality of debate in the Commons, which is basically an adversarial party political mm. type of debate, if you yeah. can call it debate, it's quite often just a slangy match. But you look at the quality of debate, particularly on constitutional matters, in the House of Lords, and it's very, very impressive. So, so I think people should take note of that, and I think they do take note of that, and, and they will be very reluctant to see the House of Lords mm. just become in an upper House of Commons with that same yeah. Yeah. Um, and slangy match type of deba debate that goes on. Yeah. And of course the House of Lords, I think I'm correct in saying, also um, forms the, the highest court in the land, ultimately. Well, it, it used to, but they changed that with, with, with the formation of the Supreme Court, of course. Which, of course, was part of the the uh, tactics yeah. of destabilizing yeah. the, the House of Lords. So what, what we can be clear about is that, it, that if we actually start to watch in detail what, what's going on here around Cameron and Clegg, but it's happening across all three parties, is there is a steady subversive dismantling of the, of the constitutional structure of this, this country. Yeah. I don't know whether you, whether you would agree with that. Yes, so, uh, well, yes, but, uh, so anyway, the reason that we wanted to, to talk about this today was because, of course, on Monday or Tuesday this week, um, the government did a U-turn and because they realised that they couldn't get support for, for, for the timetable for this, uh, this reform legislation. Mm. Um, so the vote went through to, to, to create the bill, as it were, but, but they, can't, they, they get, didn't get the vote for the timetable, so, so that can't progress. Now, what Clegg has said is that, that they will work on the rebel MPs over the summer period in the hope that they can get this timetable approved for, for the, the, ne the new session in September. Um, and, and really, you know, we don't want to let that just go. We've got we've to encourage, <coughs> you know, don't normally recommend writing to MPs necessarily because generally it doesn't garner a response yeah. that, that, that is of, of a benefit to you. But but there were so many MPs that, that, that rebelled on this thing that uh, I, I feel that it might be worthwhile uh, writing to, to, to the MPs that did rebel and offering support because you know normally they get letters complaining about this or saying you didn't do that. Or, but this, this is an opportunity to, to say, look, we, we, we appreciate what you did, what yep. you did and, yep. and we support it. And 
you know, hopefully that will give that would give them the the encouragement that they need to stand their ground, uh, because I'm quite sure that the whips are going to offer some pretty serious pressure over the next two or three months to try yeah. and push this through for September, and it really is vital that they do not win uh, yeah. this this vote. So, well, one one of the things that's coming to my head is as as this discussion is moving along is of course we've recently had the arrest and imprisonment of the. Uh, chairman of the British Constitution Group, Roger Hayes. Um, Roger was arrested early in the morning by the police and some nine hours later he's in Liverpool prison uh, having been denied all basic um, uh, uh, process in, in a court. So he was not represented, he was unable to uh, defend himself in the court. There was no jury, there was no public, well, there were no public and there was no press. Um, so at the moment we can see that, that we are moving towards a system where a sole judge or maybe three judges in a court are making decisions and, um, and we, are, we are seeing a direct attack on our liberties which means that we are now at the stage where you can just be lifted, lifted off the street. Um, at the same time uh, we've got Clegg talking about working on MPs, and you've mentioned, uh, Mike, the use of whips. Well, of course, we know that under our constitution, any vote that's taken in, in uh, Westminster should be a free vote. And this is one of the points raised by the British Constitution Group, is that the use of whips in order to blackmail, bully and browbeat MPs into make a decision is itself a process which is unlawful under our constitution. Well, that's one of the features of the Bill of Rights. That's that's one of the reasons that they want mm. to replace that piece of, of legislation. Yeah. So, I mean, we, we start off by mentioning uh, a little bit on Iran, but we've got the situation at the moment where Westminster is able to uh, take this country to war. That's not a good expression. Um, we've got the situation where we can attack other nation states, not following some free, uh, detailed and free uh, debate within uh, Westminster, but simply on the basis of a cabal of MPs clustered around Tony Blair or Gordon Brown or David Cameron now. So I think one of the things that we'd, we'd like to say to, to viewers and listeners today is that if you have still not really picked up on this um, uh, debate which is started o over the House of Lords, it's incredibly important because it is a di direct attack on freedoms and, and yeah. liberties. Yeah. yeah. Would you like to say, say anything else? We've got three, two minutes now. If you've got any other points, Tony? I, I don't think so. Okay. Anything to uh, add on that? No, no, all I would just say, i would just make the point that, that you know, uh, no system of government is perfect, of course. Yeah. Uh, the, the, the system of government that is uh, held up as being most perfect is traditionally is you know the United States Republic. Um, I would make the point that, that actually they are in no better position than we are. In fact, their constitution is being just as undermined as, as ours. Yeah. Uh, at the end of the day, the ultimate mm. oversight of what politicians and what governments do is is the people, mm. and. Uh, you know, we've got to um, educate everybody that we know uh, what the about what the issues are, and mm -hmm. remind people that if they want to maintain their freedoms, they've got to take some kind of um, they've got to take, take some, some kind of action, action them, uh, themselves. And, yep. and uh, um, the people are the ultimate oversight of all this kind of activity. So right. get I'll educated get and take action is, is the, uh, the key message. Okay, well I, I, we can end on one uh, example of that is, is uh, recently I was uh, summoned to appear at court in, in Spain to act as a, a defence witness. Uh, that was actually in the trial of Leanne Smith. I received um, a document from the Home of Office which was delivered to the offices here in Plymouth. Um, and it was very interesting because the, the Home Opi Office document informed me um, that I was being summoned to appear at the court hearing in Spain. It then said that um, under, under British law, 
uh, I had no obligation to appear at that hearing. However, if I did not appear at that hearing, I could be at risk of penalties under Spanish law. Um, what was even more fascinating is it then advised me to um, go to a local solicitor in order to understand the relationship between those two laws. So I have recently written to my MP, who's Mr Gary Streeter of the Tory party, and I've asked him in, a, in an open and public letter if he will explain to me how I can now live in a country where I'm operating under British law, but should the Spanish wish to summons me to Spain to answer any questions which they may wish to put to me, um, I have to obey that law as well. And no protection from the UK. And there's no protection from UK. So I'm looking forward to Mr Streeter's response to, to my letter. But that um, underlines the fact that if we now had several million people demanding answers from their MPs, we could strengthen the resolve of those good MPs that are starting to get worried about what Mr Cameron is doing to dismantle our uh, constitution. Okay, well, we're at the end of our 30 minutes. It always seems to go very quickly. So we're going to thank all the viewers and listeners for joining us for UK Column Live this week. Uh, we'll be back online Monday at 12 o'clock. Yeah. And um, we hope you'll join us for more direct uh, analysis of what's really happening in UK. Thanks very much.